Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, if you are not from the United States or if you are from the United States and you just don't really follow history and politics and things like that too much, uh, you might not understand exactly how our system of government works, but when our government was first founded, it was founded on the idea of checks and balances. And at least in theory, the idea was that there were three distinct branches of government, each of which had a way of checking the other branches. And so there, there was a way of kind of, you know, like dealing with one branch or another if it got out of hand or, or made some just ridiculously crazy calls. And uh, so we have an executive branch, which is headed by the president of the United States and involves our cabinet departments and uh, things like the, you know, just, just all of that. Our legislative branch, which is our uh, House of Representatives and our Senate, and they're obviously responsible for creating laws, passing those laws, uh, and then the executive branch is charged with carrying out those laws, and then you have the judicial branch in the form of the Supreme Court and our federal court system, who are uh, responsible now for interpreting those laws and making sure that they are applied fairly in our court system and in our justice system. So uh, so all of that kind of works together and checks each other. And sometimes one will get out of hand and, and do things that have just very, very long lasting ramifications. So obviously in the last few years, we've seen Supreme Court cases have become more and more in the forefront. So when a very deeply divisive political issue comes about, the Supreme Court will often make a decision that will be loved by part of the country and hated by part of the country. You know, for a long time it was Roe versus Wade, which was the decision that uh, that made it legal for all 50 states to have um, access to abortion for women. Uh, there was the decision just in the last year or so, uh, year or two, uh, th that overturned that decision. So sometimes the Supreme Court overturns itself and uh, kind of takes us down a different path. And the story we're going to look at today is one of those times when the Supreme Court actually reversed one of its own decisions that had long lasting, deep ramifications in America's history. In the 1890s, there was a Supreme Court case called uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and Homer Plessy it's been a long time since I've looked at it, but Homer Plessy was, uh, I believe, only a one-eighth black man who was being discriminated against. And to sum it up briefly and simply, Plessy versus Ferguson is what made it legal for segregation to take place, particularly in the, in the South. And what it ruled was basically that as long as you offered the same thing to people, you didn't have to offer it them to them together. So in other words, if you own a restaurant, as long as you are allowing black people to eat at your restaurant, they can eat in a separate part. So you can have, or you could have a, what they called a coloreds only restroom and a white restroom, as long as you provided restrooms for both. So for 60 years or so, that was the law of the land. That was the Supreme Court case that had made those things legal. The time and place where that starts to reverse is going to be in Topeka, Kansas, with a case called Brown versus the Board of Education. And that's what we're going to look at today. And we're actually taking a look at uh, a channel called Roaming History. He's only got 673 subscribers. And I would love for us to see him get pushed over a thousand subscribers today. So if I can get like 330 of you to subscribe to his channel, it looks like most of his stuff deals with the civil rights movement. He doesn't have a ton of videos yet, but let me just show you real quick uh, what he's got. So uh, he just got a few, but uh, a video about Rosa Parks from four months ago, a video about Emmett Till, whose story I covered briefly when I visited the grave of his father uh, in France, where he was executed. Um, and then Brown versus Board of Education, which is what we're going to look at today. And it looks like it's a series on the civil rights movement. And he visits some of the sites associated with this. So I thought it'd be fun to take a look at this today. Uh, so we're going to dive in. I'll put the link in the description. Let's check him out and get him over 1,000 subscribers today. When you step into the halls of this civil rights memorial site in Topeka, Kansas, the first thing that strikes your eye are two contrasting signs mm -hmm. hanging from the ceiling. On the left, in big bold letters, one sign reads white. On the other, a now outdated term used to describe yeah. people of color. 
These signs are displayed here to remind visitors of a divisive practice that existed in 20th century America, racial segregation. Now, back then, these signs were actually not hung here at all. That's because in the 1950s, this was an all black school, mm. Monroe Elementary, one of the schools at the center of a landmark court case, Brown versus Board of Education. Oh, so that's actually a national historic site now in Topeka. That's a place I gotta get to. At the center of a landmark court case, Brown versus Board of Education. Hmm. That's cool. So far, yeah, his editing style's great. He does a good job. He needs like more many subscribers. places in the South, Topeka's primary schools were following a precedent by an 1896 Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. It ruled that having racially segregated public facilities was legal as long as each facility was comparable to the other. Okay, so that's I, I, when I spoke earlier and I gave the example of things like uh, restaurants. Uh, I'm glad he's clearing that up because Plessy versus Ferguson, and I know specifically Brown versus Board of Education, deal more with government public places rather than private businesses. Those are things that would be dealt with with later cases. It was a doctrine that became known as separate but separate equal. But equal yeah. And when you look at Monroe Elementary, at least on the surface, its facilities did look similar to those at white schools. Take a look at these models of black institutions and compare them to their white counterparts. Both were built with similar material, had similar designs, and were alike in space and structure. Mm. And when you walk into the classrooms, you also get the sense that, again, on the surface, this school had everything it needed. The room. This is so really amazing that they've got all of this preserved like this. I love this. I, I'm so interested in visiting the site now. These were well built, the equipment was well maintained, and the teachers well trained. So by most accounts, things were up to standards physically, though not necessarily morally. Mm. At the end of the day, these places were still segregated, and honestly, for no sensible reason. It was just a racist practice. People all across the country, all across the world really, knew it was unjust and knew it had to change. So by the mid 1900s, one of the most prominent civil rights organizations, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, led a movement to challenge the system mm. in court. I didn't know that you did that. A lawsuit against the city's school board on behalf of local black parents whose kids were impacted by. So we've got a list of the parents the names of the children and the schools that they attended. So these are multiple schools, I guess probably all within the Topeka School District. Uh, and so they're bringing this almost as like a class action lawsuit. By segregation. Among those parents was Oliver Brown, the named plaintiff in the Brown versus Board of Brown, Education okay. case. His daughter, Linda Brown, was actually a student at Monroe Elementary. And like so many other African-American kids in Topeka, she was forced to attend an all black school even though she lived much closer to one predominantly reserved for white students. And this is one of the reasons why, right off the bat, you're gonna look at this and say it's really not equal because I live right near a school, but I've gotta be bused all the way across the city to go to another one uh, because of this policy of segregation. And then of course, inevitably, if you have an all black school and an all white school, there are going to be differences. I don't know if there were differences in funding, differences in staffing, uh, but I'll be interested to see if he's going to talk about the case, what was presented as the argument for this not being equal. That school was named Sumner. It's located here in this tree-lined neighborhood about seven blocks away from where Linda lived. Today, the building is no longer in use and it's largely neglected. But back when it was operational, Linda's father actually tried to enroll her here, oh. but was denied. So, instead of going to this much closer building each morning, Linda was forced to travel a longer distance to attend the black school. And it was a pretty complex journey too. First, she had to walk several blocks walk. and cross train tracks to reach her bus stop. When she got there, she still had to wait a little longer for the bus to arrive, sometimes in freezing temperatures. Mm. Then, when she eventually boarded the bus, it had to drive almost two miles, making frequent stops before it ultimately reached its destination, Monroe Elementary. And even when it arrived there, she often had to wait another 30 minutes or so until the doors opened. When the Brown versus Board of Education was heard in district court, 
other plaintiffs shared similar stories about what their kids endured. So he, yeah, another good point, point there is he talks about it being heard in district court because remember, cases don't just automatically go to the Supreme Court. They have to work their way up and the Supreme Court will decide, each higher court will decide whether or not they're going to hear that case and whether or not they're going to just let the lower court stand. Uh, and so somebody, one side or the other, will appeal. And if that appeal, appeal is heard, it can make its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the judges also heard from expert witnesses about the psychological impact segregation has on their children. One expert, an assistant professor of psychology named Louisa Pinkman Holt, told judges that the fact that segregation is enforced, that it is legal, has more importance than the mere fact of segregation by itself does because this gives legal and official sanction to a policy which is inevitably interpreted both by white people and by Negroes as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. It's impossible to argue otherwise, right? I mean, if you look at the policy of segregation, what is the argument for it except to say, we need to keep these people separate? I mean, some people might argue well, it's for the best for both of them because they're different cultures and things like that. But no, it absolutely is government endorsement of a policy of inferiority. It was a sensible argument. And when the judges later ruled on the case, they acknowledged that segregation does have a detrimental effect on black children, but they still decided to dismiss the case. Hmm. They concluded that the type of facilities you see here at Monroe Elementary were comparable to the ones at white schools. And since the doctrine of separate but equal was still in effect, they couldn't find the law unconstitutional. Basically, it meant that the only way to end segregation for good was to challenge the separate but equal doctrine directly. To do Right, you have to take it all the way to the top. And because the US Supreme Court ruled on Plessy versus Ferguson, it applied to the entire country. You know, if you have a district court ruling on something, it really only applies to that district. If you have a uh, circuit court um, that covers part of the country, that only applies in that circuit. Once it gets to the Supreme Court, that applies to everybody. Do that, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund appealed its case to an institution powerful enough to overrule it, the Supreme Court. When Brown versus Board was argued at the nation's highest court, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund wanted to make its case as strong as possible. So, they presented it along with four other civil rights lawsuits, which they had previously hmm. filed in different parts of the country. So it wasn't just the lawsuit from Topeka, Kansas. They also argued cases from Virginia, Delaware, Washington, D.C., and Clarendon County, South Carolina. This is actually brilliant because now you're making it a nationwide thing. You're dealing with different parts of the country. And so that's why you can argue it at the Supreme Court because this isn't just some local Kansas issue. This is a nationwide issue that needs to be dealt with. Which actually may have been the most important one of all. Yep. That's partly because of the conditions black students faced. This display gives you an idea of what things were like. You see here black students going to school in a small deplorable shack. Ah. Uh, while white kids had a much bigger, there you go. And better maintained facility. So this is 1948 in South Carolina. So now you're showing that separate but equal is not equal. When the South Carolina case was argued, they wanted to defeat the system of segregation together. They contended that segregation was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution's 14th Amendment, yep. and that the practice itself was harmful. To prove their point, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund called in expert witnesses. One of them was a researcher of psychology named Kenneth Clark. He, along with his wife Mamie, studied the ways segregation affects kids. And one of the ways they did it was by using, of all things, dolls. Huh. In their experiments, they gathered a group of black children and presented them two white dolls and two brown ones, including this one here, currently on display at Monroe. And the kids were asked emotionally loaded questions about them. Questions like, which doll was the nice one? Which doll looked bad? And which one? is a nice color. After many gut-wrenching sessions, the Clarks found that most of the children had an unmistakable preference for the white dolls and uh. a rejection of the brown ones. They concluded that segregation was indeed hurting the self-esteem of black kids yeah. and creating a feeling of inferiority. This is brilliant that they brought the psychology into that. That's a powerful argument right there. 
that goes beyond just facilities and funding and staffing and busing. This is much deeper than that. Wow, that's powerful. That conclusion, along with many others, was taken into account by the Supreme Court in 1952 when it started to weigh all five cases. At first, the justices were divided over how to rule on the issues, and they asked for another hearing the next year. By the time the case was re-argued in 1953, the court had a new Chief Justice, Earl Warren, mm. who worked to bring the divided bench together. For the next few months, they carefully considered all the arguments against separate but equal. That it deprived students of equal protections, that it didn't always guarantee access to the same resources, and that, by its divisive nature, it stamped children with a badge of inferiority. I want to stop and take a look at something real quick. So here's specifically what I was looking for. I was curious to know what the status was of uh, segregation in the country at this time. So segregation was actually legally required in all of these states. So you're basically dealing with the exact states that had slavery before the Civil War, right? I mean, this is literally what that is. You've got Oklahoma, which wasn't a state yet, but every state that had slavery before the Civil War are the states that had required segregation. And the ones that didn't have slavery before the Civil War didn't have it. Uh, you have no legislation here and there. You actually have it forbidden in many states, including Ohio. Um, it was optional or limited in places like Kansas, New Mexico, Arizona, Wyoming. Uh, interesting. And I, I don't know if he's mentioned this. I don't think he's mentioned it yet. And maybe he will. But the uh, the chief counsel for the NAACP who argued this case before the Supreme Court was Thurgood Marshall, who would end up becoming the first black member of the Supreme Court. So I think that's a really cool tidbit as well. On May 17th, 1954, the Supreme Court issued its unanimous ruling. It found that students... Note that. It was a unanimous decision. This was not like a 5-4 decision like you see with so many cases today, right? This was a unanimous decision. It was That is powerful uh, message to send to the people of the United States that every member of the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. This had indeed been deprived of the equal protection guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Today, part of the text from that decision is etched prominently oh. at Monroe with the most memorable line reading, quote, in the field of public education. I want to back up. I want to read the whole thing. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race deprive children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe it does. We conclude that, and then he'll say the rest. At Monroe, with the most memorable line reading, quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place as segregated schools are inherently unequal. And that's the key part of that. Separate but equal is, by its very nature, unequal. It was a consequential decision that attacked segregation in a direct way, and it became a turning point in the long fight for civil rights. Now, it would be great to say that this immediately dismantled the racist Jim Crow laws in the South, no. but the reality was states kept resisting and so think about it. If you are on the side of segregation and you lose this case, well, you're just going to double down on other areas, right? It's just going to force you to be even more, I shouldn't say force. You're going to decide to be even more forceful in other ways that you can control that. And you're going to hang on uh, with everything that you have. And, and this is just going to ramp up the tension. Partly because the court didn't explicitly determine how or when the ruling should be enforced. Mm. It wasn't until the next year when the court issued a follow-up decision called Brown 2, that justices finally gave some sort of guidance, ruling that public schools must begin integrating with, quote, all deliberate speed. Still, that phrase was incredibly vague, and most schools kept resisting, dragging their feet with impunity, and in some cases, retaliating by firing black educators. Jeez. And this is when you're going to start to see things like these cases where uh, President Eisenhower actually sends in the 101st Airborne Division uh, to enforce the desegregation of some of these schools. It was clear that the fight for simple justice was not yet won. Yes, Brown versus Board was a big judicial victory, but the movement faced more legal setbacks in the months to follow, including a completely unfathomable decision by a jury in Mississippi 
over the killing of a black teenager. We'll cover that heart-wrenching story in the following chapter of this series, and we'll explore further injustices black Americans had to endure. We're not going to look at that one right away, but I definitely want to look at that video as well on Emmett Till. Emmett Till is one of the most infuriating moments in American history for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other people. What happened to that young boy just as a parent, I can't even begin to wrap my mind around. And then for that poor mother to not be able to get justice for what was done to her son. Uh, This is not easy stuff to talk about, but it's important. It's part of history. It's a very dark part of particularly unique part of our American history. And it's something we have to talk about. So I hope that you'll join me in helping roaming history get over that thousand mark. He doesn't make videos very often, but I want to encourage him to keep making these videos because I feel like these are well done, really good production value. Uh, They're short, and so you know they're really digestible and easy, but they tell important stories. So uh, put the link in the description. Check that out, and we'll be back again tomorrow with some more. Thanks for watching.